Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the Zodiac Killer. So what are the mental health and personality factors at work in a case like this? So just a reminder here that I'm not diagnosing anybody, only speculating about what could be happening in a case like this. So usually in videos like this, I look at the crime, the trial, then the background and the mental health personality characteristics. The Zodiac Killer was never caught, so there is no trial, and we don't know anything about his background. The timeline is extensive because of the letters he wrote. Therefore, in this video, I'm going to weave the timeline together with most of the mental health analysis, but I'll still do a little bit more mental health analysis at the end. When attempting to construct an accurate timeline in a case like the Zodiac Killer, we see it becomes challenging because experts don't agree on how many murders he committed. There does seem to be some consensus around the theory that he killed five people, so that's what I'm going to cover here in the timeline. I've also not included all of the communications. There are a lot of communications that were thought to have originated with the Zodiac Killer. Many people sent messages pretending to be the Zodiac Killer, so it's really very difficult to know which ones were authentic. So now we move to December 20, 1968. A 16-year-old female and a 17-year-old male were sitting in a parked car on their first date in a remote area north of San Francisco. Not long after 11 p.m., a killer approached their vehicle. He shot the male in the head while the victim was still in the vehicle. The female exited the vehicle but was shot several times in the back. 10 22 caliber shell casings were found at the crime scene. At this point, of course, nobody knew about the Zodiac Killer. This crime alone would not qualify the suspect as a serial killer. But even still, I find this crime has an interesting parallel to David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, who primarily targeted young couples sitting in their cars. Even though Berkowitz did not make physical contact with the couples, his motivation was sexual in nature. And it makes me wonder if we don't see the same thing here with the Zodiac Killer in terms of a motive. Moving to July 4, 1969. Sometime around midnight, about four miles away from the 1968 crime scene. So again, north of San Francisco. 22-year-old Darlene Farron told her babysitter she was going out to buy fireworks. Darlene then picked up 19-year-old Michael Mayhew. Darlene was married to another man, so these two were having an affair. The couple noticed that they were being followed by another car, so Darlene sped up and eventually hit a log in a golf course. This caused her vehicle to stall and, of course, come to a stop. The suspicious vehicle followed them and pulled up behind them, but then left moments later, only to return about five minutes later. The driver parked behind them, and he left his lights on. He exited his vehicle and walked up to the passenger side of their car, shining a flashlight in their faces. Darlene and Michael started to retrieve their driver's licenses because they thought the assailant was a police officer. The killer started shooting both Michael and Darlene. Darlene was struck nine times. As the killer returned to his vehicle, Michael got a look at his face. The killer returned again and fired two more shots at each of the victims before ultimately driving away. The caretaker of the golf course reported to the police that he heard gunshots, but the police did not respond to the call because it was July 4, and they believed the caretaker was simply hearing fireworks. Not long after this, three teenagers reported the same shooting. This time, the police decided they would respond. At the scene, they found that Darlene was dead and Michael was alive. Now, this account of what happened that night is interesting because Darlene and Michael were having an affair, as I mentioned. The police did not believe Michael's story for that reason. There were also some inconsistencies with the story. The police department switchboard received a call at 12.40 a.m., which was two minutes after Darlene was pronounced dead. The caller said he wanted to report a double murder. He gave the location of the couple and indicated that the cartridges used in the murder were 9mm Luger. He also claimed to have killed the other two victims that I was talking about before in the 1968 murder. The call originated from a payphone outside of the sheriff's office. Just after this, three of Darlene's relatives received telephone calls where the caller was just breathing heavy. They didn't say anything. 
So with this murder, we see that the Zodiac Killer seemed to direct more attention to the murder of Darlene as compared to Michael. The idea here is that his focus and his drive are oriented toward women. Killing the man was something necessary for him to do what he really wanted to do, which was kill the woman. We also see some hesitancy. He chased them until they crashed, he left, and then he came back, like he wasn't sure if he wanted to go through with it. He was still trying to figure out his M.O. He was not comfortable as a killer. After being careful, if that is what he was trying to do by initially leaving, he then places a phone call from the payphone right outside the sheriff's office, taunting law enforcement to catch him. So we see hesitancy, but then we see he's really fearless. The last interesting thing I'll talk about in terms of this crime was the heavy breathing phone calls. It's possible that he knew Darlene, or else how would he have known to call three of her relatives, assuming he was the one that made the call. Darlene was also having affairs with a number of police officers, and it's thought that one of them perhaps called the relatives. That's not really a strong motive for them to do that. Another thought here is the Zodiac Killer selected Darlene because she was having affairs with police officers, and he wanted to get back at those officers. Moving to July 31, 1969. Three area newspapers receive a letter from the killer. In the letter, he supplies details that only the killer could have known. He also sent each newspaper a distinct cipher, so there were three ciphers that would go together to make a complete message, at least in theory. Here we see our first look at the Zodiac Killer's ability to murder grammar, and that's what he did in the letters that he wrote, right? He didn't have any respect for the rules of grammar. August 7, 1969, here we see a three-page letter sent by the Zodiac Killer. This is the first time the killer refers to himself as the Zodiac. In this letter, he provided more details about the crimes that only the killer would have known, and we see some other interesting elements here. He wasn't happy with not getting more press coverage, so we see a narcissistic quality here. He wanted to be admired for the crimes he committed. He was offended when people didn't recognize him. He emphasized that he was calm during the July 4 murder, that he pulled his car away slowly and didn't rush from the scene. He wanted to be seen here as dominant, confident, and he wanted to be regarded as callous and unemotional. So he could commit this murder and just drive away casually. He wasn't flustered by any of this. He didn't want anybody to think less of him. Another point, he seemed to take pride in being able to aim his weapon using this flashlight he taped to the firearm. So the police had noted he was able to shoot these victims in the dark, and he was kind of explaining how he had this flashlight. I think here he's really just bragging to the police, like he had some sort of superior method in terms of using his weapon. He seemed to enjoy the idea that the police may be struggling to break the cipher. So mocking the police seems to give him pleasure. Bringing them down makes him feel superior. A couple from Salinas, California actually decoded the cipher a few days before this letter was delivered. So he thought the cipher had not been broken, but it had been broken. The Zodiac Killer's message from July 31 indicated that he enjoyed killing people and he believed that he was collecting slaves for the afterlife. This is the first good evidence that points to this idea that he was delusional or he wanted to appear delusional. This is a belief that we see with other serial killers, like they are collecting people. The more people they kill, the more they have later on in the afterlife. So they're helping themselves. They're building up their ability to be happy later on. Death is the ultimate insult for a narcissist. Through this delusion, the Zodiac Killer could defeat death by preparing for it and looking forward to it. September 27, 1969, at around 4 p.m., at a man-made lake north of San Francisco, 22-year-old Cecilia Shepard and 20-year-old Brian Hartnell are having a picnic. The Zodiac Killer approached them carrying a firearm. He was wearing a hood, and he had clip-on sunglasses attached to the outside of the hood to cover his eyes. He told a story about having just escaped from Montana. He said he wanted to steal their car and take their money. He told Cecilia to tie up Brian with some rope that he brought with him, then he tied her up. He stabbed both of them. Cecilia would die a few days later. Brian would survive. After the attack, the killer used a felt-tip pen and drew a message on Brian's car door. 
It had a symbol that he'd used before. It's a crosshair-like shape. He also had the dates of the crimes and some other information. At 7.40 p.m., a person believed to be the killer calls the Napa Police Department and takes credit for what he described as a double murder. So the killer didn't realize that Brian was alive. The police found the payphone that the killer used and lifted a palm print from it. Here we see the low neuroticism of this killer. He's cold, calculating, unemotional, and has no empathy. He has an ability to stay calm. He also switched to a different method. So he had used a firearm, and now he uses a knife. I think here he wanted to show off his criminal versatility. He took pride in his actions, as evidenced by the resume of sorts that he recorded on that car door. At this point, we see the Zodiac Killer has tried to kill six people, three females and three males, but he failed to kill two of the males. In what might have been an effort to prove he was capable of killing men, his next target was a man. This brings us to October 11, 1969, downtown San Francisco. The killer hails a cab driven by 29-year-old Paul Stein. He asks Paul to drive him to Washington and Maple. After arriving at that destination, he asks Paul to drive one more block after seeing a man walking a dog in front of the cab. So he was trying to avoid having witnesses. The killer shoots Paul Stein in the head with a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. He then exits the vehicle and opens the front door, takes the victim's wallet, wipes down the interior of the cab, closes the door, and wipes down the outside of the cab. Witnesses called the police, but the message was misinterpreted, so the police were looking for an African-American male instead of a Caucasian male. It appears the police did actually stop the Zodiac killer when they first came onto the scene. They asked him if he saw anything. The killer reported he saw a man waving a gun on Washington Street. The police followed that lead instead of taking him into custody. In a letter written two days later, October 13, 1969, the Zodiac Killer seemed to corroborate this idea that the police should have caught him, but failed to do so. He included a torn piece of the victim's shirt, which had blood spatter on it. And he threatened to target students who would be riding school buses. Now, this crime was quite different than his prior crimes, killing somebody in a crowded area and in a manner that would certainly attract attention. And of course it did. Here we see a lot of criminal versatility and a number of efforts to avoid being caught although he did leave a fingerprint on the inside of the car. October 22, 1969. The Oakland Police Department receives a call from a person claiming to be the Zodiac Killer. The killer wants to get on a talk show with either F. Lee Bailey or Melvin Belli, two well-known attorneys. Melvin Belli did end up talking to a man on that show, but the call was traced back to a patient at a mental institution. Even though this person was not the Zodiac Killer, this connects to something we see later on. November 8, 1969. The Zodiac Killer writes another letter, which appears to indicate he committed another murder in August. The only unsolved murder from August 1969 in that area was of two teenage girls. Two years later, it would be connected to another murderer who did not commit the other Zodiac murders. This letter was also accompanied by a cipher, referred to as the 340 cipher, because it had 340 characters. This cipher was never decoded, and it's not clear that it really contains any meaningful message. So here we see the Zodiac Killer needs to feed his narcissism, even though he may be scared to commit more murders. Paul Stein was the last confirmed victim of the Zodiac Killer. The next day, November 9, we see another letter, and this one makes it clear that the Zodiac Killer killed seven people. Of course, the police believe there were only five murders, right? So he added two. In this letter, he suggests that he's going to change the way he commits murder so nobody will be able to attribute the murders to him. He said he'll make them look like accidents, routine robberies, or murders caused by anger. He talks about how he really didn't leave fingerprints behind, as it was reported in the news. He did that just to throw off the police. He again mocked the police for not catching him. He seemed to remove all doubt that the police had actually stopped him after the Paul Stein murder. So there was a massive missed opportunity there. They were right there with the Zodiac Killer and let him go. He also described how he had built what he referred to as a death machine. This would be something he would be using in theory from now on to commit more murders. 
So here the Zodiac Killer desperately tries to cover up the fact that he's not committing murders anymore. But he still wants to be feared. He wants to be mysterious and elusive. He begins a pattern of claiming victims that were not connected to him. That attorney I mentioned before, Melvin Belli, he received a letter from the Zodiac Killer on December 20, 1969. This letter was accompanied by another piece of Paul Stein's shirt. In it, he talks about working on a bomb and expresses concern about losing control. He also uses the phrase, Happy Christmas, instead of Merry Christmas. This led people to believe that he may have been British. This is interesting because this is the same attorney who the institutionalized man had spoken with on that talk show. Was this a coincidence? Was there some sort of connection between the real killer and that man that no one could figure out? Or was the Zodiac Killer listening to the talk show? If he was listening to the show, this is highly consistent with the narcissism he demonstrated before. He loved to hear people talking about him. This takes us to March 17, 1970. A woman named Kathleen Johns was driving near Modesto, California, when a man in a car behind her started flashing his lights and sounding his horn. She pulled over, and the man pulled over behind her. He got out and indicated that one of her tires was wobbling in the back. He offered to tighten up the lug nuts. After he was done, she pulled away and the wheel fell off. Evidently, he had removed the lug nuts. The man offered to give her a ride. She got into his car with her 10-month-old daughter. The man did not take her to a service station, as he promised, but rather he drove around, saying that he was going to kill her. He repeatedly pulled his car off the road, like it was going to stop, but then he pulled back onto the road and accelerated. Eventually, Kathleen jumped out of the car with her daughter and hid in an irrigation ditch. A truck driver stopped and scared the man away. In the police station, Kathleen saw a composite sketch of the Zodiac Killer and identified him as the assailant. If this was the Zodiac Killer, again, we see he breaks from any established style, demonstrating criminal versatility. It's not clear what he was trying to accomplish with this crime. He had many opportunities to kill Kathleen Johns, but he did not. Another thing I find unusual here, after she escapes, he went back to her vehicle. He put the wheel back on, moved it, and set it on fire. This was really taking a lot of risk that was probably unnecessary. The thinking about the Zodiac Killer at this time, after the Paul Stein murder, was that he was scared of being caught because he was almost arrested that day. But here we see his behavior seems to conflict with that theory. One possibility here was that the Zodiac Killer was enraged that he did not kill Kathleen Johns. And he went back to that car and set it on fire out of anger. This is similar to what we see with Gary Ridgway. When Gary Ridgway would target somebody he wanted to kill, if he wasn't able to go through with it, he would go into a rage. Although he never set a car on fire, we still see the anger component. April 20, 1970, we see another letter. Here he talked about wanting to kill a police officer because they can shoot back. He mentioned how his bomb had failed and he was designing a new bomb. And he hoped the police were having fun trying to figure out who he killed. He explains that he killed 10 people, even though the number of confirmed murders was still at five. So here we're back to the narcissism. He's brave. He's great. He'll take on any adversary. He's not afraid of anybody. He doesn't mind being in danger. He likes the thrill of killing. We see more desperate attempts to garner admiration. April 20, 1970. Here we see a letter where he says he wants people to make Zodiac buttons and wear them around town. June 26, 1970. The killer indicates that he's upset with the people in the San Francisco Bay Area because they did not wear the buttons as he instructed before. He claimed that he shot a man in a car with a 38 caliber revolver to make them pay for this failure to wear the buttons. He also gave them another cipher and a map that allegedly identified the location of a bomb. The police had already issued an arrest warrant for the person who committed the murder to which he was referring. July 24, 1970, the Zodiac Killer confirms that he was the person who abducted Kathleen Johns and set her car on fire. It's interesting here that he chose to accept responsibility for that attack. July 26, 1970, 
In a letter that was largely plagiarized from another work, the Zodiac Killer continues to complain about the buttons. Now, there was something important about this letter. It was clear from the letter that the Zodiac Killer knew what a radian was. This is a term used in geometry. It's a way of measuring an angle without using the traditional method of degrees, like a 90 degree angle or a 45 degree angle. It moves away from that. It's a different system. Later, a man named Gareth Penn discovered that one radian with an apex drawn on the location marked on the map provided by the Zodiac Killer had legs that lined up with two of the murder locations. One of those was the Paul Stein murder which seems to explain why the Zodiac Killer chose that victim. He needed to commit the murder in a particular place so the geometry would work out. So here we see the narcissism on display again. He wants people to walk around with this Zodiac button. He won't let this go. It's on and on with this button thing. He really needed to be the center of attention. Now, as far as the use of geometry, specifically his knowledge of the term radian, this has led to a variety of theories. There's this theory that anybody who understands what a radian is must be extremely intelligent, and all those misspellings in his letters must have been deliberate. He's actually a criminal mastermind, after all. This really doesn't change my opinion of his intelligence. I don't buy into this theory. What he did wasn't exactly revolutionary in the field of geometry, as far as I know. He simply put the apex of a radian on a location and lined up one of the legs with the murder he had already committed, and then looked at where the other leg went to. He figured out a point on that line where he could commit a homicide. Unusual, but not indicative of an evil genius. If he had tied all of his murders together with some type of complex geometry, that would show a higher level of functioning. I think he just remembered this term from high school. March 22, 1971 we see another letter claiming responsibility for a murder that was not tied to him. Then on January 29, 1974, we see he sends another letter claiming to have killed 37 people. This was the final verified communication from the Zodiac Killer. So I talked about the mental health. Again, I kind of wove it into the timeline, but I'm going to round it out here. So we see the Zodiac Killer is narcissistic and psychopathic. He probably would have qualified as having antisocial personality disorder, he may have qualified as having narcissistic personality disorder. Schizotypal personality disorder would have been another possibility if he was not delusional. It's not really clear if he had psychosis or not. Substance use, I think, would have been a good possibility here as well. Based on what we know, I would guess that his personality profile would be high and openness to experience, mid-range conscientiousness, low extroversion, low agreeableness, and low neuroticism. In terms of his history, we can really only speculate. There's only a small population of serial killers, so we can't really have a lot of points of comparison here. And in that small population, we see quite a bit of variability. On one side, we have killers like Dennis Rader or Gary Ridgway, who maintained relatively steady employment and were married. On the other hand, you have killers like Richard Ramirez and Joel Rifkin, who had unstable employment and relationship histories. So with that in mind, here's my guess in terms of the Zodiac Killer. We would probably see traumatic experiences when he was young. He was probably isolated and bullied, probably had a bad relationship with his mother, a fascination with fire. He would hurt small animals, fantasies of having a lot of power, and there was probably bedwetting. We would also expect to see juvenile delinquency and having difficulties in relationships with women especially being rejected early in a relationship or being rejected before the relationship really started at all. He most likely was employed in solitary work, so a line of work where he didn't have to interact with a lot of people. He was probably viewed as odd, maybe even bizarre. He was insecure, disorganized, and not self-assured. When somebody is confident, they don't have to demand that other people believe they are confident. And of course, that's what we saw with the Zodiac Killer. He probably had an adult criminal history in addition to juvenile, and it's probably one that started with lower level crimes and escalated to more serious offenses as he grew older. The last question I'll look at here is who was the Zodiac Killer? Of course, there's no way to know, but many people have theories. Many people believe that 
the Zodiac Killer was their father, right? We see a number of people who have said their father was this killer. Some people have said their ex-husband was the killer, their brother was the killer. So again, we just see a lot of people who believe they know who the Zodiac Killer is, and it happens to be a person that they're related to. No fingerprints or DNA that were taken from any of the crime scenes were ever tied to any suspects. It is kind of frightening, though, how many people are a good match for this behavior. When I looked at a lot of these other suspects, there were a lot of similarities. Every one that I looked at, it seemed convincing for a short time until we realized that there's always going to be overlap in these situations. There were probably thousands of people, if not more than that, if not tens of thousands or over a hundred thousand people that in some way shared enough characteristics with this killer that somebody could say, okay, maybe they were the killer. So a lot of people might seem like they could be the killer, but only one person could be. And again, I haven't been convinced by any of the suspects that have been brought forward so far that I've seen. Maybe one of them was the Zodiac Killer, but I don't think so. At this point, of course, it's likely that the Zodiac Killer has died. He may have died in prison or somewhere else, but either way, it's likely he's not alive now. The same traits that contributed to him being a serial killer would have likely led to a number of other problems in his life, right? So this kind of explains why we wouldn't expect a long life expectancy. I know whenever I talk about cases like the Zodiac Killer, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.